Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second family education webinar provided by, by the Family Medical Coping Initiative here at Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the Family Medical Coping Initiative is a new program through the Hale Family Center for Families at Boston Children's. And it's a multidisciplinary effort spearheaded by psychology, social work, and child life. This program was developed to provide education to families and staff about ways to enhance child, family, and family coping with the impact of children's medical conditions, medical procedures, and interactions with the healthcare environment. Today's webinar is provided by the Family Medical Coping Initiative team. I'm delighted to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Lisa Bronfman, who's a psychologist who's been working with medically ill children at Boston Children's for 23 years, and Gail Windmuller, a certified child life specialist who's been at Boston Children's working with a wide variety of patients for more than a decade. And I'm Annie Banks. I'm a social worker in the Hale Family Center for Families, and I've been working with families in medical settings for 30 years. I'll be here monitoring your questions in the Q&A today. Um, feel free to send them along during the presentation or during the question period at the end. We may not be able to answer your questions about your individual circumstance, just so you know, um, but we welcome general questions about the topic. And if we don't get to all of your questions here, we'll follow up with you via email sometime after the presentation um, for administrative reasons that usually takes a little while, but we will certainly follow up. And also this presentation is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within several days of the presentation. And with that said, um, I'd like to pass the session over to Gail. As Annie mentioned, we're gonna be talking about helping your child manage questions, staring, teasing and bullying about their medical conditions, um, illnesses and differences. Um, some children are born with medical differences and other children have differences as a result of accidents or illness. When a difference occurs at birth or at a very young age, you as a parent or caregiver are gonna need to be the ones who respond to strangers who might stare or ask questions. So in the beginning of your child's life, you're, this, this is a learning for you. And as your yet, child gets older, um, it's important for your child to learn how to deal with it. Um, either way, um, it's important to recognize that they have a difference and discuss the difference with your child. And as a parent, it's important to talk to your child about the differences when they are old enough to understand them. Um, you may wanna discuss if other people will notice these differences or if they're differences that aren't obvious. Um, for example, an allergy, people don't see that your child has an allergy, but it's important that some people know. So one of the things to talk about with your child is, who do they want to know about their difference and who needs to know about their difference. So for again, with the allergy example, their teachers, um, the school nurse, um, and maybe a friend's parents, if they're going to visit a friend, need to know about the allergy. Um, but it's also important to let your child have some control over who knows about their difference and who doesn't when it's one that isn't an obvious difference. Um, so when you're talking to your child about um, their medical difference, it's first important to think about your own feelings. Um, there's a saying, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And I know, especially as a parent, that that's very much, very, very true. Um, when your child is having a hard time as, and is unhappy, you feel that way too. And when you have a child who has um, any kind of difference, um, you can feel their anxiety with them. And, and it's very normal as a parent or caregiver to feel those anxieties just like your child has. But before you start talking to your child, it's also important to come to some kind of terms with it, to be able to discuss it 
with your child in a calm and relaxed and controlled manner. Um, your child can read, most children can read their parents very well. So being able to be calm and discuss it can be very helpful. Um, now, there's a, there's, we're gonna talk about the differences between staring, questions, teasing, and bullying. Um, staring tends to be out of curiosity. And it may be that someone has never seen somebody who has the, if it's a physical difference, um, has never seen it before. And just, it can be an adult, it can be a child. And they stare, sometimes not even realizing they're staring um, because they're seeing something that they haven't seen before. Um, questioning, and usually that, that's a curiosity thing. Questioning is sort of the next step. Um, if you have a, a young child who is outgoing, they may just write, go ahead and ask, you know, what is that? Why, why do you have that um, to you or to your child? Um, and that also is usually out of curiosity, not out of something that they're trying to be mean. Um, teasing, on the other hand, um, can both be, it, it can be either with no ill intent or it can be intentionally not nice. Um, it, it's usually something that a child will do to get a reaction from the person um, and make fun of them and think it's more like a joke. Um, but to your child, it may not feel like a joke and it's important to recognize that. Um, it, can be, um, it can be hurtful, um, even though the child who's doing it or the person who's doing it intent is to be funny. And bullying, on the other hand, is um, it usually happens in, in, in school-age children, and it involves a child um, wanting to feel more powerful or wanting the other child, the child who has a difference, to feel less powerful. And it's an, a behavior that's repeated again and again. And surprisingly, in 2019, there was a survey and they found that 22% of students ages 12 to 18 reported being bullied at some point. So unfortunately, this is not an uncommon problem. Um, there is an increase in, in staring and questions and teasing and bullying as children enter um, elementary school. And this is because children are now finally exposed to a much larger number of people. Usually when they're in nursery school or uh, preschool, they're not exposed to that many people and they just don't see as many people with differences. So it's, you know, it's surprising to them. And they, um, you know, so these questions start to happen then and the staring may start to happen more at that point. So how do we help our children with these, um, with having differences? Um, one of the things that can help a lot is to help your child develop self-esteem, um, to develop a positive outlook on themselves. And the developing self-esteem can promote um, their, the child's courage and self-confidence and make it so that um, they have a, a sort of a different perspective on themselves um, and they can think more positively about themselves. And there are different ways that you as a parent can help. Um, you can help them to develop positive ways about thinking themse about themselves as a person by talking about you know, who they are, what kind of qualities they have, what are the skills they have, um, identify the, the good character in them, if they're a good person, what they've accomplished. When your child has positive feelings or thoughts, there's a tendency for them to feel to, to, um, to more accurately judge themselves and what other people think about them. Um, they'll think more positively of it. Whereas if your child has negative feelings and thoughts about themselves, may, they may inaccurately judge what others think of them. Um, the, other, the other thing that you as a parent or caregiver can do is set an example of honoring other people's differences by how you react and to 
when you are at the grocery store and see somebody with a difference. Um, the way you, you be setting example of being accepting and not staring and not questioning. Um, and that goes very far in terms of how children learn to react to people and also how to, um, to take being different, how to um, help themselves to be different. So there's, a, there's many ways of helping your child build a healthy story about themselves. Um, one thing that as a parent that you can do, which is so important, is to pay attention to how you listen to your child. You sit at their level, um, you really listen to what they say, and this will make them feel important and um, empower them to feel strong about themselves. You can also help your child express feelings and help them understand um, the um, and, and interpret what other people are, you know, if they're looking at them or saying things um, to make them understand what the actual case is. Um, another thing you can do is stress the importance of their effort and the completion of what they do. So um, for example, to say to your child, I'm so proud of your hard work and I'm so proud of your effort that you put into this project. Even if they didn't do as well, you know, or didn't get a grade that they would have liked to have at school, what's most important is that they've tried hard and that they've put their efforts in and that will help them develop a high self-esteem. Another way of develop, helping them develop self, high self-esteem is to help them remember when they've been successful. Um, remember when you, were, when you um, finished this and you did such a great job at it. Um, and thinking about and finding the unique qualities of your child, you can work together with them, asking who am I? What are my values and beliefs? What am I good at? What do I enjoy? What can I feel proud of? If children feel good about themselves and are proud of themselves, reactions from others will have less of an impact on them. Uh, you can help your child have a broader view of their place in the world. Um, there's all kinds of differences and samenesses and pointing that out can be very important too. You know, hair color, there's differences. If, if everyone looked the same, you know, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between people. Um, our world would be quite boring. And pointing out that, it, that everyone has some differences, some that you can see and some that you can't see. And helping your child recognize um, their own ways of being the same and different from their friends is important. But, but um, to feel good about themselves regardless of what the sameness is and on what the differences are. And also developing a, um, a healthy life story has many rewards. Um, a healthy story um, promotes courage and confidence to try new things. Um, the stories can include understanding differences and samenesses, understanding hardships, overcoming obstacles, developing armor, uh, being strong about your difference, and also recognizing the importance of family and friends. Um, challenges can make individuals stronger and if they find creative ways of dealing with their issues that will also build confidence. And when a child can imagine positive outcomes that can lead down new positive paths. So if a child can dream about um, positive things happening, they can often make those things happen. And it's important to encourage them to think positively and to try things and to work at the things that um, they want to accomplish and be encouraging. And now Elisa is going to continue discussing this. So now we want to, that was what you sort of do to build the foundation. Uh, thank you, Gail. So that was to build the foundation so that you, so that your child feels like they're coming from a strong place 
in order to deal with these situations that are more challenging when they come up. So your story of how you manage difficult situations is going to change as your child grows. So as Gail said, in an infant, it's usually a parent or siblings and sometimes teachers that have to have the words and the ways of reacting to these kinds of phenomena that we're talking about. So for a newborn, it's going to be the parents primarily, uh, preschool and really early school years. Sometimes teachers have to figure out what to say or how to manage it when teasing, staring questions are happening. Uh, one thing, and, and sometimes it's really important to think about this with your child sisters and brothers as well, because it's actually more often that questions will go to a sibling. Why, why does your, um, how did your brother get diabetes would be a question that would probably come to a sibling almost as often as it would come to the child themselves. One thing to remember with, with your child is that even though one person did something that didn't feel nice, that most people are positive to remember the people who do nice things or who don't do mean things, they're much more, they're much more, there are many more of them, the nice people than the not nice people. And we just put in this slide about upstanders, just to remember that helping your children think about when something's happening that makes you feel uncomfortable, that to make sure that you um, talk to them about it. Uh, and how do you deal with it when someone says something mean to another child and teaching the concept of upstanders to all kids and helping them figure out what to say. Often they don't know what to say, so we wanna help them figure out what to say. Um, also just thinking about healthy friendships and inviting kids over for play dates and who would be a nice friend for your child. Because someone who who's alone feels more threatened by these kinds of questions or staring or teasing than somebody who's standing with one other person or a friend. So staring, first we're gonna talk about staring. Staring, uh, there's an increase in staring in new situations. So if somebody is in uh, a school where everybody knows them and knows what they look like, probably no one's gonna stare. But when you go in a place where somebody is not known to the people, they're more likely to be curious about what that person's difference is. Uh, the reason we sort of recognize the difference between cruelty and curiosity is we're probably gonna recommend different responses if you think someone is being curious than if you think someone is being cruel. It all, also, thinking about the intention of the person who's, who's staring, if you think, wow, they just wanna know about me, is a very different feeling than they're doing something to be mean to me or I'm not welcome here. So thinking about the thoughts, if someone's curious and you think they're curious, then you could think, wow, maybe I'd like to know them or tell them about my situation. But if they're being cruel, you want to think about how to stop that person or uh, stop that person from their cruelty or, or at least stop it from hurting your child. So we wanted to mention in the context of this back to school programs. So these programs can be back to school or starting school. So very often if someone has a difference in kindergarten or in a grade, whatever grade they're in, you could do a meeting of the entire class and talk to the students about, hey, this is my hearing aid. This is how it sounds. This is how I use it. And having a meeting in a school where everybody learns about the child's difference, if the child attends it, it's a very empowering time. And the other kids are curious if you um, or if you have eating differences or you have a trach or they, the other kids are curious to know why that happened and how you take care of yourself and how they can be good friends. And also by doing that as a big meeting at the school, all of the questions are answered at once. And the child, instead of being somebody who's fielding a lot of questions and feeling strange can sort of become more like a VIP status in that kind of a meeting. The hospital, sometimes the hospital can help patients with a re-entry program that was very often done for children who returned to school after cancer treatment. Um, so you can ask in the area that you're seeing if that's a program that's offered. But if it isn't, and COVID has limited these, by the way, as I'm sure everybody would suspect, some organizations provide information to parents about how to do these kinds of meetings in their child's school. For example, About Face is an organization that works with kids with craniofacial differences and helping parents run the school, run a program at the school. And if your child does not want to attend this meeting but wants the meeting to happen, that's also fine. It's just not quite as empowering. It still limits the number of questions that they are going to field. 
So what can your child do as someone staring? I love to talk to kids about this. It's, it's um, something interesting to think about with them. Thinking about when someone's staring that you have a response, first of all, makes you feel better than thinking there's nothing you could do or feeling like you should leave because someone's staring at you. The idea that there's some reaction that you can have or some way of dealing with it always makes you feel a little stronger. So the first step is sort of even thinking about being confident. There's a, even practicing with your kids' confident stances, like looking right at a person, standing up straight is just a little more confident. And then making eye contact. I always tell kids if they look at someone's nose, it looks like they're looking at their eyes. So some kids don't want to make eye contact and you can practice with them. Does it look any different if they're looking at someone's nose versus their eyes? And usually when I've done that test, which I've done a number of times, it doesn't look different, uh, nose or eyes. I also think with them is sometimes even just smiling at that person. Usually when someone is staring and you smile at them, they usually smile back, especially if they're curious. Uh, and if you make a neutral comment or say hi, or make a thing, oh, it's nice out or something like that, usually people respond and it can become uh, a happy interaction or a more normal interaction if your child wants to do that. Um, I think with, with, with kids, it, it's also important to sort of think about if the person's staring and they have a mean look stare versus just a curious stare. It also alerts the person that's staring, who are, they're often unaware that they're doing it. So it's sort of like catching them when the child stares back. It's a way of catching them and making them aware of what they're doing. And they're usually embarrassed and look away, which is what some kids enjoy. And you have to think about the personality of your child when you do this. Some kids really enjoy staring back. And I don't know if how many of you have been a staring contest with someone, but especially if they are unaware that it's a staring contest, if you stare at them and you keep looking at them, your child is most often gonna get people to look away. And that feels very empowering. The other piece here to talk with kids about is kids often feel like they have to be nice and polite to adults and reminding them that they can say, I don't want to talk about it. They can walk away. They don't have to engage with someone if they don't want to. So we like to think, so that was our staring moment. We're going to talk a little bit about questions. There are questions that people typically ask. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're just they're not creative they're often the same so what is it how did it happen can i catch it does it hurt will it go away so i'm going to give an example of a child i worked with who had an ear that was partially formed and how she worked out how she was going to both first of all understand these questions for herself but then think about how to talk to someone else about it so what is it she said well when i was born my ear was not completely formed and how did it happen well, it's just the way I was grown. My, my development didn't continue uh, when I was being, when I was in the womb. It just, it stopped and my ear stopped growing. Can I catch it? No, it's just the way I was made. It's not, it's not going to, um, it's not something anyone else can get from me. Does it hurt? No, but in her case, it does affect, as she would say, it does affect my hearing. So you'll notice that I often look at you with the side of my face that where the ear is more fully formed because I hear better out of that ear will it go away well it won't go away on its own but when i'm fully grown i can have a surgery that will help make my ear look more like other people's ears if i want that i'm trying to decide if i want that because it won't help my hearing it will just make my ear look like other people's ears so that's just one example but i think when you think about it it helps kids to it helps kids to go through this process of thinking about these questions for the most important person which is themselves and for you. So the reason to figure out answers to these questions is in part so your child has those answers. And then when they have the answers, they can decide who they want to share those answers with. So this is we want this is so important to me. I love the concept of preparation. So help your child prepare their answers to these questions again for themselves and for other people. So a big piece of that is recognizing that they can't control others, but they can control themselves and decide what they want to share and what they don't want to share. And again, these are predictable kinds of questions that people ask again and again. Uh, and help to, if they feel like they really know the answers, they're going to be able to speak more confidently and to remember that they have no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed. Uh, I also 
think with them about the kinds of people who are asking, like the age and development of the person who's asking, probably they are just curious most often. And just remember young adult, young kids and sometimes adults who have some um, difficulties often will say inappropriate things. So preparing those simple and straightforward answers. I always tell the story, this girl gave me permission to do it when I was in person at um, in psychiatry at Children's. A little girl um, was in the waiting room and she had a huge, um, she her face was half red, which is again how she was born. And a little child came over to her uh, in the waiting room and said, hey, what happened to you? Were you in a big fire? I mean, well, I overheard this and she had really thought about it. She was, she was I think, five and a half or six at the time. And she just confidently said, no, that's the way I was born. It's my birthmark. And the doctors tell me it's going to get less and less as I grow up. And in fact, it did. And um, it was funny. I, I thought, gosh, was that hard for her? But she was just so used to saying those words that she didn't feel embarrassed or ashamed. It was just, hey, this is how it is. So more on this topic. So thinking about neutral words or positive words, like her answer there, like even if you think it's my birthmark or that's how my ear was made, is a way of saying there's not, or you know, even that's how my body is working right now, um, or I don't have enough of something in my body. Anything that just really gives helps your child have information without it being um, my body is terrible. So we want to again think about words that help them feel more confident and more positive, even if something was going on is a difficulty for them. Uh, there was a kid who um, had, was catheterizing at school and everybody knew that she was doing this. And, um, and a kid asked her about it and she said, hey, um, I don't ask you about how you go to the bathroom and I really don't feel comfortable talking to you about how I go to the bathroom, which I thought was a really good answer. She did come up with that on her own. But again, you say you can have an answer for yourself that you don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing and reminding your child that as well. And when people are being cruel or asking the same question again and again, to remember to help your child think about how they can set limits and what they can say about that. Things like, I've told you once and I'm not telling you again. Uh, I don't feel comfortable answering your question. I don't want to talk about it right now. Uh, or even sometimes even distraction. How about we talk about the Wizards of Waverly Place we both like that show. Again, that they could set limits when kids keep asking the same questions again and again, and that they also understand that they can walk away. They don't have to be polite to impolite people. We've all learned this from telemarketers. But I think the first time a telemarketer called me, I was engaging and saying, yes, uh, okay, no, and, and you're trying to get off the phone. Now they call and probably all of us click and say, you know, no, with, in the most impolite way that we wouldn't normally be. But it's hard to remember that when others are impolite, we don't have to maintain our, um, we, we don't want to be cruel, but that we don't, that we can walk away and say, I don't want to talk about it. Another just piece to remember is as your child gets older and also gains more information or as they're changing, the plan can be revised about what they'll say to other people or how they understand their own medical situation. So Gail talked about this a little bit. I'm just going to add another point here. What's the difference between teasing and bullying? Teasing is meant to be a form of communication that's often playful. Sometimes it has a mean edge, uh, and it, sometimes it's very annoying. Sometimes the receivers don't appreciate it. But teasing can also even go among friends. And um, I was telling these guys that I have a friend who was teasing me about a situation that happened that actually made me a little uncomfortable. And I had to tell, as an adult, I had to tell my friend, I don't can you stop bringing that up again and again? So sometimes she meant it to be fun. She thought I thought it was fun, but I actually didn't. So I had to tell her. Um, bullying is more of a repetitive pattern of behavior that's meant to cause harm and make people feel badly or powerless. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I say to kids, because sometimes kids report doing some of these things. You know, they're unaware that some things are mean. So when I talk to kids about it, um, you know, in my role as a psychologist, usually, I ask them, is that something, let's say they tell you something that they were doing and somebody else couldn't take a joke or something. I always ask them, is that something you would find funny if somebody did that to you? Or when they're planning an April Fool's joke. I ask, would you think that was funny if that happened? And that's a way of getting at, is that something you should do or not? I also like to ask them the question, is that something that um, 
who are you choosing to do that? Is that something you can, who are you choosing to do that and why? If somebody is teasing somebody and it's not a friend, but somebody they don't like, I ask, oh, was that something you would do with your friend? Um, and just something for them to think about, like how do they assess whether something is mean or not? I also ask them if they tell me they're teasing and it's just funny, how would you know if the other person found that funny? Are they smiling? Are they laughing? Do they usually walk away? Do they tell you stop it? Trying to get them to read the cues of the person they're doing this with. So in terms of teasing and bullying, um, schools are now often have a mission to stop bullying or to make their schools a bully-proof zone. And they often have to write up a report to give to, a, to, give to the you know, Department of Education if bullying is going on at their school. So if something's going on and you alert the school, they're likely in our current climate to take it more seriously. Now, why is there an increase in bullying in, in elementary school? As Gail said, it's partly kids are more, more in the wider world. It's also that kids are more often alone with their peers and uh, with preschooler, uh, preschoolers and other younger kids, people don't have as much access to tease and bully without adults um, oversight. So that's in part why it is. Now, why is ignoring not my best solution or the solution I recommend the most? And it's usually, it's the most often recommended by parents, teachers, and others, just ignore them. Uh, the reason I don't like it is when you ignore someone, you make it seem as if there's nothing you could say. And it starts to make the person who's being bullied feel like the people who are saying those things are saying something true because there's nothing to say back. And even if what they say back is in their own head, it's really important to think about, to think about it and have a reaction, even if the reaction is not to the bully. The, the reaction could be to yourself. Uh, remind your child to think uh, about whose opinion is more important is the bully, is what the bully thinks more important is, or is what you think more important or what your family and friends think? And, and just to remember that bullies are seeking a reaction. Another reason why ignoring isn't so great is if you ignore it, first of all, that's really hard to do. And crying, if they see you crying, if that's what they're trying to do, then um, they, they're certainly feeling success and power, unfortunately. So we want to feel like your child has something they think they can do, or even if the answer is, go to you later on and discuss it with you, that's also a reaction. Um, so I like to think about this concept, this concept of building armor. And um, so a task, something I do with kids quite often is I have them open their hands, sorry, I don't even know where my hand is here, and think about the strengths that they have. So I'm good at art. Uh, I like the show Survivor. I, I'm somebody who is interested in uh, theater, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a, such a strong, a, such a strong strength. It could just be what they like and who they are. I'm someone who lives in Newton. I'm somebody who um, can hop on one foot. Whatever it is, they have these things that are true about them, and they hold them in their hand. And I have them hold it in their hand and bring it to their chest. And you can ask them the question: Does what the bully says take any of those things away from you? And the answer is no. And I, my daughter was being bullied once in middle school and we did this thing. And she told me that even 10 years later, now that she's 20, even 10 years later, when someone was saying something mean, she remembered the strengths she had and held them in her hand and brought them to her chest to remind herself that whatever other people say does not take away or change who you are. I think that's really important to remember. Uh, the reframing, so this example of someone's teasing you for having glasses, um, I think even that concept of, um, so what? You know, I, people called me four eyes a number of times when I was a kid and I was like, yeah, I wear glasses. And I think that idea of, yeah, uh, my ear isn't quite built. Yeah, so? That idea of, it's not that, in, that people are focusing on something and you can just reframe it. Yeah, that's true. If you can, if you feel okay about it enough to do it. So when do you need to take more actions? So you've prepared your child, you've helped them build the positive self-esteem, and you've also helped them sort of think about who they are. They've built a little armor up, they practiced what to say, they know what their answers are to themselves, to their family, to and to potentially um, other kids or other people who might ask. And it's not working and it, your child is starting to get more upset and uh, depressed maybe, then you, that's when we have to take more action. If your child has a problem with bullying, you can reach out to the school, to other helpful adults, uh, friends in their lives. You can consider psychotherapy and 
remember, I'm a psychologist. I'm going to think psychotherapy is helpful for everyone. And even sometimes that psychotherapy can happen in the school. And we also like to think about if that bullying child might need help too. Now, it's not always the case that you reach out to the other parent, but if you know them, sometimes you can. Sometimes that backfires. It really depends on the situation whether that's going to be a helpful one. But sometimes thinking about the other child's situation can also be useful in a way of thinking um, about you know, why they might be doing this and what troubles they may have if you can help, if your child is in a position to be compassionate. I had one patient, I'll never forget this, where a child was really, really being mean to him and he and his mom had the idea, we together came up with the idea of inviting that child over for a play date, trying to understand more about what the situation, obviously it wasn't a physically dangerous situation. And they decided to make pie together. And in the context of making pie, this child became friends with this child and never bullied him again. And we realized he had a very hard situation at home and that I think just created greater understanding all in all. Um, we'll move to the next slide, although I'm going to say one. Oh, okay, I always say move to that next slide, but I have one more story to tell. So one other child gave me permission to tell his story, and I think his mother might be here on the Zoom, though I can't see her. But um, I really want to share his story. So this is a child who had a heart transplant, and as a result of his tra heart transplant, he gained some weight, which is related to the medication and the heart transplant. And there was a kid at school who was calling him very mean names about his weight all the time, really awful, a number of kids. And at one point in thinking about his answer and thinking about it, he decided to have the courage, which we're all so proud of him for, say to that other child, the reason I gained weight is I had a heart transplant. And he gave some more information about how he nearly died, the entire situation. And the, um, the other child now had sympathy and now understands him and is calling him titanium heart and giving him power bumps uh, in the hallway and is acting as a protector. Um, so um, thank you for letting us share that story. He, and we're very proud of him. And, and, and now he's gotten rid of his own bullying situation by taking that matter into his own hands. It doesn't always have that wonderful solution, but it's amazing how many times uh, people can shift from being mean to not uh, as well. So if your child has anxiety, that's a common thing in our culture. Uh, just especially so many kids suffer from anxiety because our world, especially right now, is kind of has a lot of scary things going on. If you add in that they feel or look different or dealing with a medical situation and responses from strangers, it's going to add more anxiety. So just something where you can seek additional help for your child in managing anxiety. It's a good thing. It's just, just as an aside, in um, focusing on the kids who are being mean, sometimes it's really good to focus on the kids who aren't being mean and develop a group of friends or people like you. Sometimes joining an organization of kids who have a similar issue can be really helpful. So you don't feel alone, but you're definitely less likely to be bullied when you are standing with one other person. And Gail, I turn it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, in terms of um, particularly facing uh, back, we had talked a little bit about back to school visits and um, uh, starting school with a new situation. Um, there's many nonprofit organizations out in our world um, that can really provide a lot of support. If you Google search um, your child's medical condition, there are names of organizations that will pop up. Um, for example, there's a Children's Craniofacial Association, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, the Epilepsy Foundation, the Center for um, parent information and resources that particularly serve parents of children with disabilities. And one example that was um, one of my patients um, who had, a, had um, was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and had to go back to school, um, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation provided uh, brochures for teachers, for schools, uh, for parents, and it provided the information that the, that the teacher could use so that they understood what the issues were around Crohn's disease. And it, it allowed the child to feel more comfortable in the classroom because for example, they may need to go to the bathroom immediately. Um, that's explained in this brochure so that the teacher, if the child said, could I please go to the bathroom? The teacher wouldn't say, oh, we'll wait till recess. They would know they need to just let the child go the bathroom. Um, 
And each of these organizations has not only brochures and information about how to help your child in school, but they also may have um, different books and resources that can help your child understand their own situation. Um, in addition to using them as a resource, just Googling, again, Googling your child's difficulty and, um, or not their difficulty, their difference um, will also help find potentially some books that they can read or that you can read to them. Um, two that I found that were um, particularly interesting. One is called Just Ask, Be Different, Be Brave, Be You. Um, it was actually written by the Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Um, and she has um, diabetes. She had type one diabetes as a child. And she decided to write a book about differences and how, um, how, oops, sorry about that. How in spite of the differences, um, people can be very strong and can show how their strengths are. And she um, specifically talks about diabetes, asthma, blindness, deafness, um, dyslexia, autism, Tourette syndrome, ADHD, allergies, Down syndrome, stutters, and kids that use wheelchairs. In her book, she has a different child that has each of these um, issues and also talks about how they have um, become strong and are able to handle those problems. So I suggest this book um, for school age kids and, and then for younger kids, there's a book that's called It's Okay to Be Different. And this book um, really talks about all kinds of differences and, ex and is an, emphasize, an emphasis on accepting others. Um, there is a little bit about medical differences, but they're basic medical differences. It's um, a wheelchair, the crutches, a broken arm, um, but it also discusses just diversity in terms of skin color and language and different ethnicities. Um, and I know that there's many, many books out there for different medical differences and the organizations that were on the past slide or ones that you can Google um, most likely can suggest books that can be helpful uh, with, you know, for your child. And now we're going to, whoops, let's see if I can. So we wanna thank you very much for attending and I'm gonna turn this over to Annie. Hey, thank you. And we have had some excellent questions in the chat um, or in the Q and A. Um, one of which is, I'll just say, uh, was a general question about the recording of this event and um, maybe others related to the Family Medical Coping Initiative and whether that can be shared with school counselors or others. And the answer is absolutely resounding yes. Um, and we will eventually have a website too that has um, recordings, brochures, et cetera, that um, people, the general public can access. The answer is yes. Um, we have a question, really good question about um, upstander bystander issues. So, you know, what do you do when your child's closest friend has not been an upstander and instead has joined in or maybe initiated uh, whispers with other kids while staring and giggling? This is uh, specifically about a third grade child. Um, how, how do you address that? Um, Gosh, with friends like that. Um, wow, uh, that's a really good question. And I think the question is, could if if this person is a friend one thought would be why is that what's why is that person doing that and could there be could that person would that person be willing to have some practice a conversation um with that's one where if the parents are friends and the child is a friend where i might want to help ask those parents if they could talk with their child and help him or her be someone who who knows what to say or knows how to say it um, it's, it's a hard one because it sounds like the, it's not only that the person's not an upstander, it sounds like they're also initiating some of the teasing and bullying. And I, I wonder if that's a, 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 that's a situation where I probably would involve adults to do some practice and teaching of that child, to sort of figure out, um, 
if they can figure out better words or if they have questions or why they're doing what they're doing. But we really definitely want the closest friend to be, if not, if not an upstander, to at least be somebody standing by, which is the bystander role, be somebody in it with your child, as opposed to being someone initiating it. I think I would practice that with that, have ask the other parents if they could. And if it's not a situation where you're comfortable with uh, the parents, I wonder if, if the child is close enough, if, if your child could speak to her and say, oh, I wonder why you're talking to other friends about this or what's happening with that and trying to figure out, I, I think more information about why that, does a person feel like they can gain power and attention by doing that with other kids, by getting other kids involved or does she, does he or she, I don't know why I assume it was a she, why does he or she, could that, could he or she feel like because they have a closer friendship with your child, could it be that they feel like they're getting some social capital from knowing and bringing it up? And maybe they could have a role. I think it depends a little bit on why they're doing it. If they're doing it because they have more information and they're closest and they want other people to know that, maybe they could have a role of saying, oh, I'm her, his or her friend. I'm the one who can say something about this too. Um, I, I know something too, in a way that's proactive and positive instead of this negative way in which they're interacting. I think they need to prepare your answer or at least a discussion about what they're doing. Lisa, thanks. There, there's another kind of re related question to this, um, but this is about kind of when you're talking about, you know, empowering a child to show like a classroom, right, about their difference and kind of answering a lot of questions right off the bat, basically by, by putting that in the child's hands. And this is, you know, so my daughter wanted to do a show and tell about her surgery with her class, which has caused some physical difference. Showing photos from the hospital, you know, is that too much? And if kids are being unkind, this is related to the other situation with whispers and giggles and things, um, would it make her even more vulnerable to ridicule? Well, I think, well, I think the question is, that that's such a that's such a wonderful question. I love it when people make a book like you make a book like Shutterfly is so easy. It's just so easy to make a book. You can even make it at CVS about, you know, this is my story. And um, we've done so many of them, especially for the kids in the craniofacial department, which are which I thank everybody who I've worked with there who's taught me so much about this topic, because it's something obviously the kids deal with a lot. Um, I think thinking about what you'd put in a book or a story that's the more totality of someone's experience. So if we wrote a book that was called My Name is Lindsay or My Name is Michael, you wouldn't want the only part of it to be your difference. You'd be like, oh, my name is Michael. I like hockey. I like this. Like you'd want a more full story. So in the same sense of um, if you're going to share something with the class and, and the teacher and the teachers are willing to do it, I think having adult support in doing it is a value the question of how much do you show i think sh I, it's similarly to the child who was catheterizing that didn't want to share how um she went to the bathroom with other kids because that's sort of private information i think carefully about the pictures from the surgery and are they um are they in a spot where the person normally wouldn't reveal are they are they like revealing some you know showing a part of your body that other people wouldn't normally see like do the pictures add something and also, uh, I, I always think about this when we're doing preparation for procedures, we think about what the child will experience. So they don't really need to know how a surgery is happening. They're not performing the surgery. They're asleep during the surgery. So thinking about what's before and after. So if the pictures are gruesome, the reaction of the other kids is likely to be shock. And the question is, what parts of that do they need to see? Is showing them a, a, a huge wound, unhealed wound, or like, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about the pictures of a surgery. But I think thinking about what you'd want other kids to know or see, like, even if you said I had 25 stitches, that doesn't, that will, people, or kids are more likely to say, wow, 25, that's a lot of stitches. But if you show a picture of it, they're likely to go, ew. And the question is, what feels better to your child in experiencing? They're probably more likely to say, to want that, wow, 25 stitches than a picture. So a picture is worth a thousand words, but maybe the words, they're not necessarily the words we want. So I think about what the reaction you want your child to have, and none of those kids are going to perform that surgery. I think thinking about, you know, here's where I stayed. I'd almost rather, it was like, here's where I stayed in the hospital room. I had to stay here for three whole nights and the food was this or that, because that's what they truly experienced rather than 
pictures of the actual surgery. If there's a swelling and you want them to understand, wow, I was really swollen and look, I went from this to this, you could think about which ones. I'm not saying don't include them, but I think think carefully about what you include both for your own child and because of the reaction the other kids are likely to have. I think carefully about that. And then, um, and I know Gail's gonna add in on this, but I think this other piece here is, um, I, I would think less is more sometimes. So will it make it worse by adding more information? Um, I do, I, I'm not saying it will make it worse, but what we don't wanna do is change the spotlight from who your child is as a person to who your child is as a patient or a person with a disability. We want them to see the whole child. So I think this concept of, that is careful in the presentation, it is important to say, I had this surgery to fix my knee that doesn't work, or and now my knee, and now I can get back to running and playing, and wow, it was so great in the hospital, I, I learned how to play chess, or things that make a whole child as opposed that focus in and create a story about them only about one surgery. I think I think that is something to be cautious about. But that was a really good question because I think when whenever you decide you're going to go in and give information, thinking about what information it is, is it enough? Does it explain it? Is it too much? And what are the child's likely ch other children's likely reaction is something to think about. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Gail. What were you going to add in? No. Um, and also, if you um, if you've had surgery at Children's Hospital, a lot of the child life specialists will actually help you develop. Um, and make a book about your your child's experience um, and include the, some of the um, really fun things that they got to do in the hospital. So it isn't just about um, the procedures or the surgery, but it's about having an opportunity to participate in bingo with um, with the uh, the um, no, the hub champ, the television station or having the clowns visit and um, you can, or going up to the garden and having a picnic if the weather is nice and taking photographs of those experiences with the, within the hospital is also a great way to share that the hospital was more than just having this surgery and that it was an experience that this child had that was a broader experience. Um, there's artists in residence, there's music therapists that visit, and sharing those things are also could be included in this story, which makes, it turns the story into a, a positive experience, um, both for your child to focus on the good things that happened to them, and to help other children understand that it's, there are good things in the hospital as well. It, it's not an all negative um, experience when you come to children's. It's funny, after these presentations, I've had other kids come to me and say, um, I wish I had diabetes or I wish I had that, <laughs> which, you know, I'm not sure that's exactly what we were aiming for, but the idea right. that um, there's something important about you've done something important that made you stronger in a way that was uh, a good, a good part of the story is I've gone through a lot of this and I'm stronger. I'm me as a result. And look at the kind of person I am that I've that I did that surgery and I'm still going, I'm still happy, I'm here at school and I have friends, those kinds of things. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna, I, and I'm, I'm trying to generalize some of these questions a little bit. This is an excellent question and it's about high schoolers. That's good because um, we didn't talk as much about that. Which we haven't right talked as much about. So can you give some advice geared toward my high school kids? Um, this is about a 15 year old boy who um, has a disorder that prevents him from participating in, in gym. And he has a very difficult time participating in more physical shops at his school. Um, he's provided with a chair, but he felt super embarrassed and did not want anyone to know why he could not do what the other teens could. Um, it's really difficult for him as a boy. And um, he avoids talking about it. So we, you know, Welcome to the world of teens, right? <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that situation and also, you know, when someone doesn't, um, having a hard time, but doesn't want to talk about it? That it's so hard when they don't want to talk about it. And it's also harder when it's a high school and they don't want to talk about it because you can't get as much information from a teacher in the school about what's going on there very often uh, on their own more. I think part of what we are talking about is 
the importance of preparing the answer. And the question is, you know, obviously he has some feelings to work through about about his how his difference is affecting him that he's he's feeling badly about it. Part of the reason he's having trouble talking to others might be he hasn't come up with his own way to make sense of it. And it's still something that's very painful for him to think about. I think it's uh, a lot of times when something's painful for people, they avoid it rather than approaching it, which is a just a common problem with anxiety. When you're anxious or upset about something, when you avoid it, it's harder to make progress on it. So that's that's one of those times where it's frustrating as a parent in that situation. But I think as much as you can help him understand what the what the piece is, uh, what is what's going on that this is the case, and what can he do versus what can't he do. I think I might, um, as much as he could tolerate, again, it's a, you, you as the parent know best, and parents are the biggest experts in their kids about what he can think about. But it's the case that other people will notice that he's not participating and will ask. So he still has to sort of think about what to say. He doesn't want to share the whole story. I think the idea that you could have a story that doesn't have to be the whole story can often be helpful for kids. So you don't have to tell people everything, but they may ask or they may be curious or they'll come up with their own story. So for him thinking about what he would want people to think when he's not participating might be part of it. I'd also think about, is there one friend that he would tell and what part would he tell? Or under, so this is uh, in the world of contemplation and, and, and psychological change. He's not ready to do a classroom or auditorium presentation to everybody in the school about why he's different. No way, that would be extremely traumatic. So we're pretending that everybody could do that. He's not ready and that's not a good idea to do that. But what could he do? Or what's one person he could, what's one person he could tell and what piece would be comfortable enough to tell and under what circumstances? So not telling him he has to, but you know, who do you think you tell? Or is there anybody that would find out or that you would want to know? Or who would that one person be? And if you could identify who that one person is, why them? And what would you say? Because you, you could identify one person you might tell under some circumstance, and you still might not tell them the whole story. You still might not, it still might not be everyone. And I think for him also, because he's very embarrassed and it's a really a big hardship for him, I think I might ask also, what he wants, let's give him some control. He feels a little out of control about it. Sounds like he wishes he could do some things that he can't. What teachers could be involved or what would he want them to know? Could he be involved? If you're emailing the staff to talk about it or getting him accommodations or he's going to meetings about that, what would he want them to say to other students that ask them? Because people are going to say to the gym teacher, why isn't Bobby coming to class? And he can't really control that. But he could think, all right, here's what I want the gym teacher to say about Bobby not being there. He could be involved in what other people are saying. That, that was a long answer. I hope that answered it. It's very really hard when your kids won't talk. And, that's, and, and, and it is an avenue. I think I'm going to add one thing. Just remember to say yourself to them what you feel about it and, you know, that you don't feel uncomfortable talking about it. Now, they're not going to tolerate a big conversation with you. We could even just say, you know, I'm proud of you going to school every day. It's amazing to go every day when it's so hard for you that you can't or that that's a hard thing for you. Knowing that you're in their corner, even if they don't have to talk to you about it. Thank you. You know, I see it's 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 one o'clock. We have a, a couple more questions or one is a comment. And so I think I'm going to throw it in. And then for the other questions, I hope it's OK for all of you. We will be sending you responses in a few days. Um, but um, someone offered a resource. And so I just want to share, um, they said they really like, I think it's a book, um, When Charlie Met Emma. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, this person says, we sent it into preschool and it was so well received by the teachers or students. Um, also the book Wonder is typically read for this purpose. If, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book Wonder, it's about uh, a boy in school and de dealing with bullying. It's often read in fourth or fifth grade, but if you haven't read it yourself, it's a wonderful book. And it's a movie, right? Yeah. And it's a movie, <laughs> for those of you who don't want to read. Um, but anyway, thank you, everybody, so much for coming today. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, hope you got something out of it. And hope um, we'll keep you informed of our upcoming talks. <laughs>